All right, let's uh, get started with the ad hoc affordable housing committee meeting. And we're going to, uh, we don't have any uh, voting items um, on the agenda. Uh, we've got two presentations. The first one is from uh, Ms. Hubbard from MDHA about uh, the consolidated planning process. Oh, ho hold on. Let's try now. My name is Angie Hubbard. I'm the Director of Community Development at MDHA. I'm joined by Mr. Jim Harmison, the Executive Director. Do you have any comments? No. I'm just going to dive in. What, um, what we're doing today is um, briefing the committee on our upcoming five-year consolidated plan on housing and community development. This is um, to explain the process and the timeline and how we're going to get public input. And we would like, um, if there's time, to get your thoughts on how we can get public input as well as information or ideas from you on needs and strategies to address housing and community development. So these are just the things we're going to cover. There is a handout that Ms. Rosie's distributing. I'm not going to go through all the slides in detail because of time. But I am going to spend just a moment to, to describe what the consolidated plan is. So Nashville gets money directly from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, the Community Development Block Grant. So HUD requires that cities that receive this do a five-year plan. This plan will use data that HUD has provided us, and we get to use local data, as well as gather data or information from stakeholders and the public so that we can identify housing and community development needs, then establish priorities and align resources. This plan will cover the period of June 1st, 2018 through May 31st, 2023. So there are three overarching objectives to the consolidated plan that we must address. These are providing decent housing, creating suitable living environments, and expanding economic opportunities. So these bulleted items on provide decent housing, this is what HUD requires us to assess in the consolidated plan. One of the handouts that you have, it's a two pay, a front and back, lists these more um, where you can make notes on ideas that you have. So these are the ones that we have to assess on providing decent housing. We're not limited to, the, to this if other needs or issues come up. Likewise, these are the items we have to address when evaluating um, suitable living environments, and then when we consider economic opportunities. Again, we have a list of mandated items we must consider. So what we'll do is we have to develop this plan in accordance with HUD regulations. If you like a good regulation and need some light reading, I've given you the citation. Then as HUD also tells us the template we have to use, but we try to make this as user-friendly as possible, especially when it's out for public review and comment. And it's organized into the following sections. We describe the process. This is our whole public input process. All the meetings that we've had, or then we have our needs assessment, our market analysis, then we have a strategic plan. Then finally, we're going to have an action plan for the first year, which is June I I got one. 2018 through May 2019, that tells how we're going to program the federal funds, the block grant money. We will also have a whole appendices that uh, contain public comments that we've gathered throughout the whole process. Then there will be maps and other exhibits at the end of the document. So what is the needs assessment? These are the things we have to look at. There's a general housing needs assessment, disproportionately greater need. That is whether or not a house has one or more conditions that HUD defines as disproportionate housing need. That's overcrowding. That's either substandard kitchen or bathroom facilities or cost burden. We do a homeless needs assessment a non-homeless needs assessment addresses persons that have, um, have HIV. The non-housing community development are things like parks, sidewalks, public amenities, community uh, facilities. 
Then we do a market analysis. Again, we look at the general characteristics of the market. We look at lead-based paint hazards throughout Davidson County. We look at public and assisted housing and that market. We look at facilities that address persons that are homeless. We also look at policies that relate to affordable housing, but we're going to do more than that. We're also going to look at other things like access to credit, um, criminal history. We want to look at all barriers to affordable housing. Then we'll have a, a robust discussion on our needs and our market analysis. We'll have a strategic plan that has all of these elements in it. And one, what I'll note about midway down are goals, objectives, and accomplishments and outcomes. These are things that we have to measure. We have to provide goals during for each year of the five-year plan. And every year, we will do a report to HUD that tells of, of our progress on meeting these goals. So we'll do this by, again, using HUD-provided data and tools. But I know you guys are thinking, don't we have a number of reports already that talk about housing needs and anti-poverty strategies? So good thing that HUD lets us use alternative data. So these are some of the other resources that we'll be relying on heavily. And we have had a working group that meets once a month that Adrian Harris convened that includes uh, Lee Stewart from Metro Social Services, Morgan, Judy Tackett from Metro Homelessness Commission. We have several other, we've had someone from planning. So that as we go through this process, we're not duplicating things that they've done, but we're actually aligning. We'll be looking at whether our data is consistent with what's already been presented. I'll be honest, HUD data is sometimes behind because they've got to run the American Community Survey data through other filters before they publish it. Whereas some of our local resources actually use the American Community Survey data as it's released. So we are making sure that we have the most current information. The assessment of fair housing, I was before you last year to talk about a big study we did on um, fair housing. Our plan was actually under review by HUD when they decided to delay the implementation. However, we made a commitment to the groups that we met with, to the citizens of Davidson County, that we would incorporate those goals, and we keep that commitment through this consolidated plan. But one of the biggest pieces is the input we get from stakeholders. These are the affordable housing providers we work with. They're homeless assistance providers. They're nonprofits that do community-based work. We'll have invitation um, meetings with our stakeholders on various topics. We'll also have um, a series of public input meetings. Our partners at the Metro Homelessness Commission is actually going to lead the whole stakeholder and public input sessions for the homeless section. Our partners at the Housing Fund are going to assist us with conversations on housing. We're going to have a survey that will be out for about a month. And at the very end, we'll have a draft, and that will be available for review and comment for 30 days. As I mentioned, we'll also have our first year action plan. This five year plan is implemented um, on an annual basis for the each year for five years, we've got to come up with an update. And that specifically talks about how we'll use these four funding sources CDBG, HOME, ESG, and HOPWA to. Uh, address some of these goals and priorities. So our timeline is that we are working in the planning and input phase through mid-April. We'll be drafting and writing at the same time as we're going through input, but we'll complete our draft by April 30th and release it on May 1st. It will be available for public review and comment to the end of May. During that time, we'll have at least four public hearings in different parts of the county different times of day, maybe lunch, maybe after work one day, a Saturday, different locations. We want to get as much, um, as much out into the public and easy for them to access. Again, we'll have their comments summarized. We won't submit to HUD until we actually know our final budget, and that depends on when Congress passes a budget this year. As soon as the president signs a budget or continuing resolution to a full year, then HUD has 60 days to tell us how much funding we'll get. 
We'll update our plan. We'll co go out with estimates based on current year funding. Then it will go before the MDHA board, and then this will be, since it's a new five-year plan, an ordinance at the Metro Council. So what we really need um, is for people to get on our email list. We have a very robust list of over 500 people, but that doesn't touch all of Davidson County. Nearly, um, even a small portion, our partners and Metro agencies are using their listservs. But we're also asking people to email us and get on our list if we don't have them. Every Friday by 4.30 on our website, and this is the URL, I'll be posting updates. And then our communications director will be posting updates on our social media feeds, Facebook and Twitter. So it's really important for us to people to be, know about what we're doing and to get engaged. So we did this presentation on Thursday night and we asked the participants to really give us feedback on two critical areas since we are in the formation of the draft. One is how can we get widespread citizen participation? We really want to make sure low and moderate income persons know about this plan. The HUD resources, that is who is targeted. For home ownership, it's 80% or below area median income, and for rental with our home program, it's 60%. So we're looking at address, making sure low and moderate income persons have an opportunity to comment. We want to make sure persons with limited English proficiency know about this plan, know about opportunities to provide input, as well as persons with targeted dis persons with disabilities. Then on this one pager that I uh, distributed, or Rosie distributed, the objectives, we asked people to look at that and let us know some of their thoughts. They can take it home, make notes, come to a public meeting that we have for input. They can mail it or fax it or email it to us. Or we took comments at the public hearing. So that really is the end of my uh, big broad overview of what the consolidated plan is. This will be a document that's going to be incredibly dense, so we're going to try to make the draft as easy to read and navigate through as possible so that the public can truly understand what we're planning for the next five years. So at this time, I'm glad to take any questions about the con plan process or these two items, Mr. Chair, if, if time warrants or if that's okay. Um, thanks. Any any questions from committee members? Council Lady Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Angie and Jim, for for being here and letting us know what what the planning uh, mechanism looks like. One one of the uh, two questions, um, one on on funding and one on sort of coordinating with with the housing issue in Nashville in general. Do we have any feel at all how much money might be coming in on, for CDBG and home relative to past years? Do we have a starting point for what we think will be allocated this year? All indications are level funding from the past year, which really? is around $4.6 for CDBG and around $1.9 from home, nearly a million dollars for HOPWA. ESG was a little different this past year. We traditionally get around $430,000. They had a little um, bump with 630, but we expect that to go back down to around 430. So we are expecting level funding. And yes. oh yes, of course the 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 administration, the president's draft budget has eliminated these programs, but they have been um, resurrected in yes in the past, and um, Congress has re. Um, brought those back and funded those in the continuing resolutions. Yeah. Yes. So there's a continual fight at the federal level to make sure that these programs stay funded. So advocating for these programs Absolutely. is still very important. Yes. Huge. Yes. So anyone who's going to Washington please, with the National League of Cities might want to talk to their and, council and members about that. And we have fact sheets and okay. um, information that we can certainly assist with. Okay, if you could send those to me, that'd be great. Yes. Thank you. And then the second question was, one of the things that we uh, continue to try to uh, uh, wrap our arms around is sort of the, the, the grid that both council member Mendez and I sort of envisioned of, you know, here here are what the needs are for the different AMI and, and here's different groups that are meeting those. 
Is there a way to marry the information that y'all create here with regards? I mean, now we have this magic number that that uh, of 33 million people who will need housing if we can't preserve and create new. Is there is there a way for y'all to help plug in your piece of how y'all will help fill that gap or prevent that gap from from happening? So we will. Our plan has a full needs assessment, which will also look at the other needs assessments that have been done and the market analysis, again, building on or aligning with the other s studies. Then our piece will, of the funding that we oversee and administer, will plug into the gaps that are HUD eligible. Right. In the 60 or 80 percent, plus some of our resources we cannot use for new construction. Gotcha. Such as CDBG. So we, we will clearly show how we can plug in with our funds, and then there will be obviously need for discussion on how the other gaps are filled. Exactly, but you can, you can yes. show us where you fit in the grid, which is, which is huge. Thank you, that's very helpful. And, and Council Lady, you said uh, 33 million people. I meant 33,000, sorry. Th it goes uh, up every time, doesn't it? 30, 31,000 units. 31,000, all right. Let's, let's, it's getting better all the time. <laughs> all right, thank you. Councilor Vercher. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, thank you, Director Harbison and Angie, for also being here. I have, a, I have two questions. And my first is, because um, I'm, I'm not uh, too familiar with the process, what's the process for um, MDHA selling land um, that they own? That's my first question. And then my second question is, um, what's considered uh, a re revitalization area? Like, where's that, where's that definition? Those are my two questions. Well, we have to look at it. So um, I'll speak to the second question, because I think the first question is more procedural. Um, there's a CDBG tool called Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Areas. We haven't deployed that tool in about 10 years, but we are looking at reintroducing that. And that is a <laughs> census tract where 70% of the residents have incomes at 80% or below. We had targeted place-based census tracts in our prior, in our current consolidated plan that expires on May 31st. However, um, HUD has indicated that if we have census tracts that meet this income requirement in a promise zone, they can automatically be considered as a neighborhood revitalization strategy area. So that's specifically how the consolidated plan will re define the revitalization areas. Through the HUD programs where we've made land available, these have been small infill lots that have been awarded on a competitive basis. Both mics are on, Mr. Harbison. Oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. So it's a pretty bigger topic on land sales because it varies by program. Um, but in general, all program, any sale has to be approved by the board. So the simplest answer is our board has to make that decision. Um, Angie, for example, has land that she has acquired through uh, HUD funds, programmatic funds like HOME, CDBG, that must be sold under certain conditions governed by HUD that the board really doesn't control, but they have to approve that sale. Um, we're out of almost out of receiving financing for public housing, so we've got right at 480 acres in the heart of Nashville with no debt. You probably heard that bumper sticker from me a couple times. Uh, but our board didn't intend to sell any of that. We're redeveloping that. But each of those, pretty, pretty much every parcel we have has some string on it from a federal program and those programs greatly dictate how we dispose of or if we even do so. And by and large, we're not looking to sell anything, we're looking to redevelop it right now. Hope that answers your question. And on revitalization, I'll just one tangent, that's a pretty elastic term. We have a revitalization mission, for example, in the redevelopment world, which I'm sure the chair and others are very familiar with. That term is used in the state laws for the redevelopment districts. What Angie was addressing was revitalization using federal terms. So again, Often you can get confused on the basis of the terms you use. I hope that helped. Any more questions, Council Lady? All right, thank you. Councilman Hastings? Yes, hello, hello Mr. Director and Angie. It's good to see you guys. 
I just wanted to ask a question, Angie. Is this the same process that we went through last year? Um, can you clarify on with, with the action plan? Yeah, with the action plan okay. that we, we actually, I, I spoke to you uh, previously and we went over some things uh, and to explain that. Is this the same process? The, the action plan last year was the fifth year of our current five-year plan. So it is a small, that was a smaller scale um, discussion than what we will be having when we develop this five-year plan. All right, so we'll be, we'll be moving just a little bit bigger in, into some things. And uh, Mr. Harbison? Uh, I know we have, have talked previously. I'm not going to go into the kid and caboodle, but I know we have a lot of, lot of area over in my, my district, and uh, we'll revisit to see where we are so we can make sure that we get things done in this budgetary uh, season to get things going. All right? Thank you. Let me, uh, so there's no more committee members, but let me ask you guys um, this question before we let you go. Uh, what, what can we on the council on this committee do to help with the process? Uh, advertise um, public hearings, public meetings. If anyone wants to host a community meeting and have us out to speak, we would certainly love to come. I don't want to overemphasize it, but this administration is going to cut this program to the bone. So if you guys, any of you in your professional life, go to D.C., Congress, they're betting on the come that the Republican Congress is going to put back in the money they've taken out. But the, 19, uh, the FY19 budget has no money for these programs. We've already started that engagement. Angie's in D.C., I'm in D.C. So to get the funds back in, though, we've got to energize Republicans to support really kind of a Democratic program in a way. So if you're going to D.C. and you have a chance to speak to elected officials, emphasize the importance of this to the community and how it started as a Gerald Ford program, all of these. They're Republican forward. They are Republican initiated for community development and engagement, and that will be very helpful because we're going to win. You know, I like to win. We all like to win. We're going to win, but it is going to be another tough year to get the money back in there. So, and right now it is not in the budget. So I would just say that'd be something you could really help with. Your elected officials, you represent our community, you talk about how important it is to other elected officials as you engage with them, it could, it could really help. All right, thank you. Ms. Hubbard, um, for the slide that uh, um, says what people can do to advertise this, maybe um, if you could send us, um, send me that as uh, sort of an email that's forwardable, um, I can make sure that everybody in the council gets it. Great, yes. Thank All right. You. Uh, any more questions from the group? All right. Thanks a lot for coming, and we'll Thank move to you. the next presentation. Is it, is it on the same computer? All right. So next, um, we've got Emily Thaden and Marshall Crawford talking to us about uh, the status of uh, getting a community land trust started. I defer my chair to my board member. <laughs> <laughs> This is mine, don't go in. Thanks. I think you go first. Oh, here, then let's switch slides. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for coming. Hello. Um, yeah, it's okay. on. All right. So I'm going to talk very briefly because I'm joined by our nonprofit partner and literally the nation's expert on community land trusts. So yeah, you know, you're pretty great. Um, but <laughs> um, hi, I'm Morgan Mansa. Um, I'm the director of the Barnes Housing Trust Fund in the mayor's office. And we are here today to talk with you all about some progress and some steps we've taken with launching Nashville's first community land trust. Um, just a refresher on 
where we've been and where we're planning to go. Um, so in the spring of last year, we released an RFI to see which nonprofit in Nashville would be interested in partnering with us with creating this first CLT. Um, we received really strong applications, four applications in total, and um, from reviewing that with folks on staff and, um, you know, some other you know partners who have some expertise in CLTs. Um, we selected the housing fund to be the city's partner. Um, Marshall can share you know a, a lot about the housing fund, but something that stuck out to us about their model is that they um, are currently uh, running a shared equity model, um, which is you know within the CLT space. And so we felt like their experience with that, making sure it's successful, um, showing that they're committed to long sh long term affordability through that shared equity model, um, proved to us that they'd be a really great partner with being um, the city's partner uh, with the CLT. And so um, a lot of folks have asked, why is it that we've selected a nonprofit partner and why haven't we as Metro um, maintain ownership of the CLT? And it's really because it's um, forever affordability. Um, we want to work with a group who has experience with that, who is really energized and excited to be that forever partner with stewarding the CLT. Um, it's more than just um, owning the land. Um, there's a large component with management, with um, you know continually uh, communicating with the folks who live in this community land trust, helping to build this model for Nashville. And we felt like having a nonprofit partner and empowering them on doing this um, was way more beneficial than um, you know the two of us within the mayor's office um, taking on that charge. Um, we thought it was very important to select folks who already have experience with this, already have that expertise, and so um, it just made sense to uh, create that partnership. Um, something else to note, too, that I think a lot of folks in the community don't completely understand is that while we have helped with the initial seed money with creating the CLT and working with Marshall to create this community land trust, at the end of the day, this will be the housing funds community land trust that they are managing, that they are running on behalf of Nashville. And so when folks are interested in partnering with this community land trust, when they're interested in figuring out how they can grow and participate, whether through development, whether through donating their land, or in some other capacity, it's gonna be the housing fund that they'll partner with with, um, with this community land trust. And so um, just to show a little bit about what we're committed to as Metro government um, through the Barnes Fund, we will help with staffing the community land trust, providing funding uh, for a staff person that will be housed in the housing fund, um, and then also supporting financially so that they can have some technical assistance through Grounded Solutions Network and some other partners to ensure that this um, will be successful on the front end with building that model. Um, we're also going to be a partner with the housing fund, with Marshall and his team, with the community engagement piece, um, whether that's going to community groups and talking about the CLT model, um, whether that's you know talking with um, neighborhood groups to figure out how they can participate both in that participatory capacity and then also with residents we we want to be a partner with them um, in that first phase and hopefully beyond that as well um, another way that we're going to contribute is through um, the donation of Metro property um, as you all know we already donate property to a number of nonprofits um, through uh, the back tax process when, when properties are back taxed. And so we're taking a look at that inventory right now to see um, which parcels make the most sense with donating to, um, to the housing fund for the CLT. Um, and then the third piece is in addition to operational dollars, we're also going to donate um, seed money for the sticks and bricks and for that phase one of development. Uh, we could certainly invest more beyond that for future phases, but we as the Barnes Fund and on behalf of council and Metro have committed to um, providing that initial seed money for funding. funding. And so something that you'll hear a lot more about tonight from Marshall um, is that you know this this commitment from the housing fund and what all they're they're committed to um, you know undertaking uh, these next couple of years and beyond and so as I mentioned briefly they're going to be that long tour um, that long term steward I feel like I'm saying a lot of words that sound alike um, but <laughs> they're going to be that long term steward for um, the community land trust they're going to be that lead with um, the community engagement with residents and with community groups um, they're also tasked with securing additional funding um, you know beyond what we um, as metro will be donating to um, the housing fund and the CLT and then they will be the leads on that project management piece
And so uh, briefly, just to give y'all some perspective on where we are with this, um, as I mentioned last year, we did select the nonprofit partner. Um, at the next council meeting uh, on March 20th, you all will be voting um, yes or no on, uh, you know, us investing dollars for operations, which we think is critical. Um, we definitely need money so that folks can be hired and to um, build this model for Nashville. Um, after that point, uh, Marshall's team will be hiring a community land trust model, uh, starting MOUs with their uh, TA partners, and then um, y'all can read the rest. Marshall's gonna talk a lot more about that with you all today, but just wanted to give that to you all to put that into perspective of where we are with uh, creating this CLT. And so I'm going to hand it off now to Emily Thaden. It's so hard for me to sit down while presenting because I typically jump around a lot. So forgive me if I'm bouncing around in my seat a bit. But <laughs> um, so I'm Emily Thaden. I know some of you, but for those who don't know me, um, I'm the director of national policy and sector strategy with Grounded Solutions Network. We are a national nonprofit membership organization of community land trusts, inclusionary housing, and inclusionary zoning programs and then other nonprofits that are committed to creating affordable housing with lasting affordability. Um, and so we provide our members as well as uh, cities that are pursuing affordable housing policies with training, technical assistance, resources, research, advocacy, lots of stuff. And so most of the work I do is actually in other cities or in DC. So it's really exciting to think about doing something in my own backyard with these great partners. Um, so, I'm going to just do a little bit, oh sorry, I'm going to do a little bit of a background just on what community land trusts are for a level setting, um, talk a little bit about the history, and then uh, talk about some critical components for making sure that we get this right. Um, so what some of you actually might not know is that the conversation around community land trusts and its unique form of home ownership, which is called shared equity home ownership, We've been having this discussion in Nashville for over a decade now. <laughs> um, and so when I was a doctoral student actually at Vanderbilt, I uh, was partnering with a uh, housing trust, a group of a coalition trying to establish the housing trust fund in Nashville, which we know ended up being successful, thank goodness. Um, but so uh, when the recession hit, we realized that wasn't really going to be the time where we were likely going to get a dedicated funding source. And so a lot of, um, Kay Bowers is here, she was involved with this. Uh, a lot of our affordable housing developers and housing advocates in Nashville took a step back and identified another problem that we started to see. Um, which was, uh, you know, we were going into uh, neighborhoods that were significantly disinvested. We were building affordable housing and high quality product. We were helping to revitalize communities. Some of them ended up gentrifying. And once these finally became neighborhoods of opportunity, we lost the affordable housing. Because at the time when we built it 20 years ago, we thought 20 year affordability periods were a long time. Um, but we have quickly come to realize that we are chasing our tail a bit when it comes to producing affordable housing if we don't ensure that we actually retain it and keep it. Um, and so that group ended up actually uh, building a smaller consortium which included MDHA and they applied for funding to address the foreclosure crisis in Nashville and through that they received funding through the housing fund uh, to develop a shared equity home ownership program. I was actually brought on at that time uh, to develop the program. And uh, so this is an example of townhomes in Chestnut Hill. And I remember sitting in those <laughs> I remember sitting in those meetings and people saying, wow, you know, this neighborhood is not going to need to worry about gentrification anytime soon. And here we are, less than a decade later, right? And thank goodness, these homes are forever affordable and will always provide a home ownership opportunity for lower income people in that community. Um, and so I think that this is just such a great example of what the housing fund can carry forward in their work if we actually resource them up and really double down on doing this kind of work. And they have experience doing it. Um, so the time is now to get land and trust, as we know, because uh, developing affordable housing doesn't get cheaper as your market heats up. So to talk a little bit about the history of the CLT movement, um, so the first community land trust was actually established in Albany, Georgia, 
uh, by a group of African American farmers to gain control over their land so that landlords could no longer take advantage of them financially. Um, they had been kept in a very insecure position on this land, which was their livelihoods. And with a couple civil rights leaders, including Slater King and Charles Sherrod, these uh, African American farmers decided to collectively organize and purchase this property. And so they ended up building their homes on it, and it was uh, you know, the livelihood for their families. Um, and so New Communities was incorporated in 1968, and it was actually the largest tract of land owned by African Americans in the country at the time. And so that basic idea has taken off today across the country with over 200 CLTs in over 40, I believe we're at 46 states. Um, so CLTs are designed to acquire, own, and steward land permanently for the common good. Um, CLTs can acquire land in different ways. They can either purchase land on the open market, they can receive donations from private developers, or they can, um, more likely, they typically get land donated from the city or through land banks that are government run. But no matter how it's done, whenever land enters the CLT portfolio, it remains in that portfolio in perpetuity and is not sold. Um, and when they think about how to utilize the land that they have in trust, they don't ask the question, what is the highest and best use? They ask the question, what does the community really need? And then they pursue that to every possible extent within reason. Um, so in addition to providing affordable home ownership opportunities, which what we are the most well known for, um, CLTs are doing everything else from single family rental to multifamily rental to mixed income, mixed use, commercial properties for community services, urban agriculture, you name it. Um, and so CLTs keep in land, land and trust through a dual ownership model. Um, and they do that to secure the property for the common good and to ensure its ongoing affordability. So in a dual ownership structure, uh, the individual who's typically the homeowner, uh, they actually just purchase the built structure or the improvements and the community land trust retains ownership of the land underneath that home. And it's a 99 year ground lease that actually ties these two things together. So the ground lease outlines um, the rights and responsibilities of both parties, and it also establishes use restrictions, such as making sure that these homes are actually used as a primary residence. Um, and then it also sets affordability restrictions. <coughs> and so the perpetual affordability restrictions are what sets community land trusts apart from other affordable housing. Uh, so CLT, CLTs will ensure that the homes that they develop are affordable not only for the first occupant, but every subsequent occupant who will also be low or moderate income. And they do this by using public subsidies to lower the initial sales price to make sure that it's affordable to their targeted income buyer. And then when an eligible buyer purchases, they're signing a ground lease. Uh, they know everything that they're getting involved in because lots of education is done and it's going to set forth what you can sell the home for in the future and who you can sell the home to. So who the eligible buyers are. So you can't just take this home and sell it at any price to a household at any income level. Um, and so then the subsequent buyer is going to do the exact same thing. They're going to sign a 99 year ground lease they're going to be educating what the program does, and this is going to uh, effectively be paid forward over time again and again. And so um, for those of you who are numbers people, I wanted to present this quickly. For those of you who are not, feel free to take a nap. But um, I just wanted to give an example of what we really traditionally see uh, places do when they're trying to deliver affordable home ownership opportunities, which is most do down payment forgivable loans or grants and the difference between that and the CLT model. Um, so let's say we have a household at 65% of the area median income, and what that means is that they can afford a mortgage at around $155,000. Um, well, if you're in the down payment assistance program, you're going to go out and you're going to buy that market rate home, which is worth $200,000, um, and you're going to end up having this down payment assistance loan for $45,000. It's effectively given to you, right? And, um, and so, so in the CLT model, the difference here is that you're not going to buy the house at $200,000. You're going to buy it at a discounted price of $155,000. And that's because $45,000 of subsidy, the same amount of money, is going in, but it's tied to the property, and it's effectively hidden behind the deal. Um, and so that way, it's really retained in the property rather than granted to a homeowner. And then when we look at 10 years later, the difference in how these programs work is that you know both of the homes, fair market value is the same, but when the down payment uh, user sells, they're going to sell at fair market value and they're going to walk away with the principal they've paid down on their mortgage, the entire forgivable loan amount, 
and depreciation on the fair market value, not on the mortgage that they were paying for $155,000. So it's a big windfall for that one homeowner. But the problem is that we, as a community, are in the same spot now. We've lost that public investment, and now we have to come up with even more money to help another subsequent buyer enter into this home. Um, on the CLT side of things, you know, the homeowner will buy at that discounted price. They're going to sell it at a discounted price of $185,000. This ensures that they see some gains from the home appreciated in value, but it also ensures that the home is affordable at the same income level. Um, and the homeowner here is going to end up walking away with $57,000 after putting in hardly any actual cash to this deal. Um, so meanwhile, we also don't need one additional dollar of public subsidy to offer the same opportunity to someone else in the future. Um, and the added benefit of this is that um, inevitably, as neighborhoods improve, these homes are going to be existing in neighborhoods that are high opportunity. And so it's a great, you don't want to keep having to move your subsidy around or going further and further out in order to offer an affordable home ownership opportunity. We want some of our affordable housing to be located in great places of opportunity. Um, so this is a very prudent use of public money, um, and it's a self-sustaining model. Um, now, when a nonprofit becomes a CLT or develops a CLT program, they are making a permanent commitment to stewarding land in service of the community. You used all those words earlier. Um, so this means that they have to develop a very like substantial policies and a very robust program in order to oversee that the homes remain in good condition, the homeowners are successful not just at attaining but sustaining home ownership, and that they're protecting that public investment. So stewardship is a lot of work and it's absolutely not an option. You have to do that work if you're doing permanent affordability. The other thing that's not an option is the C in CLT. Um, it is what makes this model authentic and transformative. It's because the very concept of a CLT is to have the community control its own fate and to benefit from the development of land. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into all of the ways that this is done, but the C cannot be superficial, and I very much appreciate the Housing Fund's commitment to that. Um, lastly, I do want to point out, and I'm happy to share any resources after this, the good news is, is that we have a lot of research on the outcomes and performance of this field, um, and uh, they are performing on their promises. Um, so they are increasing access to home ownership. On average across the country, we're serving at the 63% AMI level, which is far lower than traditional down payment assistance. We are improving the likelihood that home ownership is sustained. We have uh, the ma vast majority of homeowners are staying in these homes for um, over five years, which is not the case in the private market. We reduce the likelihood of foreclosures at the peak of the foreclosure crisis. We, were, we had a foreclosure rate that was 10 times less in the most vulnerable population. Um, and our homeowners are in fact building wealth and the houses are in fact staying affordable sale after sale at the same income level. So just to quickly wrap up, I like to show off fun examples. So just to start off, this is an eco village done by a community land trust in Madison, Wisconsin called Troy Gardens. Um, these homes were designed as an intentional community and as you can see from the picture in the center, there's conserved land which was also a part of their goal. They developed a farm which is supporting a couple small local businesses and they have resident and community gardens so that residents and the outer community are all interacting and engaged with one another. Um, these, forgive these photos because I took them myself on a tour, um, but um, this is the old North End in Burlington, Vermont. This was uh, Burlington's most dilapidated and dangerous neighborhood in the early 90s. Uh, the CLT there ended up actually acquiring parcel by parcel this land over time to acquire the majority of the neighborhood. Um, and so uh, then they built out a ton of community services for this very low income community from a food kitchen, senior center, daycare, legal aid, a park, a bike shop. But because they have so much of the housing around it, people aren't getting displaced. The people that you actually want to have benefit from this are in fact able to stay and enjoy that neighborhood. In Athens, Georgia, they're developing homes, but they're also doing robust community engagement with urban agriculture. They're running farm stands that are done through a program with high schoolers and senior citizens. Um, in uh, Denver, Urban Land Conservancy is using the CLT model to address affordable housing around robust public transit. They were quickly seeing speculative investment and they're working so hard to stay ahead of it and make sure that they have affordable housing where they need it. 
Uh, in Durham, they have served historically black communities uh, that were uh, really dealing with a lot of blight. And their goal was to lift families up into home ownership who were being excluded in the market otherwise. And they've been very successful at doing that. Uh, and it's the same story in Delray Beach, but I love to end with smiling homeowners because I hope we have some soon too. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak before all of you. Do I really need to say any more? I mean, what Morgan provided and Emily provided, I think my job is done. But um, for those of you who don't know, the Housing Fund has been around for 20 years. We've been quietly serving Nashvilleians and the Nashville community in several capacities. I think a lot of you will remember the 2010 flood and it was the housing fund who was commissioned to provide assistance in working with those families to be able to address that. But in addition to that, we have currently helped over 3,300, and that number continues to go up, first-time home buyers be able to achieve home ownership by providing over $22 million in down payment loans to be able to offset um, the cost of for them to be able to obtain housing in various communities around Nashville. In addition to that, we've been able to provide over $40 million to for-profit and nonprofit developers so that they could purchase, rehabilitate, and construct new housing for individuals who are interested in obtaining home ownership as well. And so when you look at the perspective of where we are, we've been able to leverage the resources that we get from our investors and from our partners uh, for over um, $400 million in private financing and being able to create about um, 1,300 units of, of housing in various communities there. So where are we here? This one here? There you go. So when we started to assess the capacity of being able to create a community land trust, um, our team came together to sit down and say, hey, you know what, what questions do we need to ask ourselves before we take on this particular undertaking? And the housing fund is very excited. My board got very excited about this. Um, my staff is very excited about it. I think our partners are very excited about us playing a particular role. I've been able to engage um, some of the nonprofit organizations out there and obtain feedback as we developed a, a concept paper to be able to address some of this. So um, these, these critical questions here need to be addressed and answered. Um, some of them we are able to answer immediately. Others will be actually addressed as we continue to develop the model and put the model together. So the first question talks about the number of units. How many units would we have to establish to put a portfolio large enough together to ensure that we're mitigating displacement? Um, what would that look like and how can we address that? Um, the second question talk about the mix of housing. What does that look like, the tenure of it as well, um, for this particular portfolio of being able to establish a community land trust? The third question gets around strategies. What strategies would we need to employ to be able to build a sustainable portfolio of, of, of providing housing that is obtainable for low-income individuals? And then the third question, and, and Emily spoke to this, um, pretty eloquent, equity. We're talking about subsidy. How much subsidy would we need to be able to address and ensure that we can provide attainable housing to many of low-income individuals? And then the fourth one, which I'll address more clearly here in providing is, how much operating subsidy would we need to be able to adequately staff a community land trust to move it forward? So again, of these five questions that we've been able to identify here, um, we can, I can easily address three of them today. And then the other two will really get to the heart of what a community land trust is really all about for Nashville. So let me, let me share with you some recommended strategies. Um, Emily noted that there are various uses for community land trust, housing, commercial, and community space. 
and other aspects um, from some of the examples that you saw also. And interesting enough, I worked for NeighborWorks America for 13 years, and there's three examples of which I played a very critical role in helping organizations around the land trust by providing with funding or technical assistance or bringing in experts as well. So when we got to thinking about some of the strategies, I wanted to ensure that we had strategies that were inclusionary, meaning that they brought in the nonprofit organizations. They also were able to utilize for-profit organizations as well. Um, the Community Land Trust also is inclusive of individuals if they want to donate property or play a role in the Community Land Trust, or even um, other business and other developers who also thought that this would be uh, a great opportunity for us. So the first strategy speaks to undeveloped land, whether it's donated or the housing fund or somebody acquires that particular property. Bringing that on and then working with developers or the community and being able to um, go through an undertaking of what should be on that undeveloped land. The second strategy speaks to the acquisition, the rehabilitation, and the resale of existing single-family homes or multifamily units, being able to rehab those units and then putting them back into um, bringing them up to code and then making sure that they're adding value to the community that they're a part of. The third strategy speaks to the acquisition and the demolition of properties that don't meet code or we just feel like it would cost too much to rehab them, so tear it down and then start fresh. And then the fourth strategy speaks to scattered site. Um, Emily showed some examples there in, in Florida where a number of those homes were scattered site units. So identifying scattered site units, if individuals aren't able to acquire those units, then putting them on a plan and helping them get to a point where they start off as rental and then maybe eventually get into the home ownership opportunity. But the, the fifth strategy speaks more to where the housing fund would play a very critical role, and this speaks to the stewardship piece. Emily spoke um, very clearly about what that role is for the, particular, for the housing fund, and we would serve in that capacity of hiring adequate staff, skilled staff, individuals who understand what it means to provide leadership and working with communities, understand how the land and the structure works, and providing individuals with clear understanding and education about um, the community land trust model as well. In addition to that, um, we would also work very, um, effort, we would also provide opportunities for our partners to come together and weigh in and provide some support for us and helping us. Emily is a wealth of knowledge, so she would play a very critical role in helping us guide and provide the energy around what really needs to happen as we develop the community land trust strategy as well. We've built out a budget. Um, this budget is, is very clear. We know that in order to be able to support long-term affordability, it's going to take adequate staff. It's going to take resources. We've been working with the shared equity program, and we know <coughs> how much energy that is taken to operate that. And so we wanted to come up with a budget to make sure that the budget adequately supports long-term sustainability for a community land trust, making sure that we had the staff and the resources to be able to um, do this on a long-term basis. And so Morgan had spoke earlier about a projected timeline. So I'm basically just adding some value to what she provided to you here. And this right here simply coincides with the phases. She had listed on her timeline a phase one and a phase two. I just wanted to give you some perspective of what we've been able to do up to this point. Again, you saw we developed an operational budget. We provided a business model concept paper. Um, we have a grant agreement in place with, with um, Mr. The, Mr. Crawford. the Barnes Fund. Um, just because I, Mr. S Councilman Sledge looks like he's leaving and he had his button pressed, so I, I want to give him a chance to ask what questions he had no problem. before he leaves. I know we're running a little bit long. No problem. Oh, hold on. Go ahead. Thanks, Chair. I made a uh, spousal commitment to dinner tonight. Um, the, uh, the quick question I had was regarding when we were talking about um, first of all, obviously being on the commission, we talked through this and this is fantastic. Um, one of the questions I think may, came up, may come up is when we do a CLT model and we talk about that home price, I'm sure some people will be asking about assessed value as well, right? Does, do we see CLT effects 
over a macro view affecting assessed value and revenue streams for, for, these, for these cities who are doing this? Uh, yeah, so there is a common misconception that the discounted prices will end up uh, hurting nearby property values. And that absolutely is not the case. Um, so, and that is like very much worked out in all standard appraisal mechanisms that these properties cannot be utilized um, like w uh, with their encumbrances to be used to appraise next side by side to other fair market value homes in the private market. Um, so that ends up not being an issue at all. Um, sorry, there was one other thing you had mentioned. What was it? Um, no, I, I, th I think is that, that the Yeah, I think that addresses that. I, I, I can imagine there'd be some, when starting a program like this in a new market, about loss of, re well, assessed value and loss of revenue goes along the same way. So if the assessed values are staying consistent or at least mirroring the communities around them, then we would expect the revenue streams to stay constant as well. Yes, yes. The one thing that I think will need to be discussed is uh, making sure that there's equitable taxation on these properties. Um, so if a homeowner is not able to see the full fair market value of the property, sh you know, the question is should they in fact be paying property taxes on the full fair market value of the property? Um, and so um, I think that there's an argument to be made, especially when these, uh, w we have certainly seen anecdotally and not been able to do the research yet to actually show that, uh, you know, when you're putting in quality affordable housing and more home ownership in the neighborhoods that need it, you actually end up raising property values. Um, so, I mean, that ends up compensating for it oftentimes, but I do think that we should examine equitable taxation for the homeowners. I think going forward, if there are models that are out there for those sorts of mechanisms that could be applicable here, I think yeah. that'd be helpful. Great. Thank and you. I think Denver plays a very critical role in, because it's gone through a very similar situation that we're going through here as well. So we can definitely bring that research to bear a little bit more as well. Great. Okay, mm -hmm. I want to also ask you this. Um, so the Office of Housing is also uh, doing some research to launch the tax abatement program. So properties that are owned by nonprofits, seeing if we could abate taxes in some way, because at the state level, um, as many of us know, we tax properties that nonprofits own at the same level that we do the, uh, you know, fair market or the, the general market. So, um, so we're going to look at the CLT to make sure that that's included in that as well. Great. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And so I'm wrapping up pretty much okay. and just speaking to some of the things that we have done. So the Barnes um, Housing Trust Fund Commission provided its blessing. We're here tonight to get your blessing as well. Uh, once we, after tonight, we will start looking at establishing an advisory committee. The advisory committee will be led by a few of our board members, but it will include some of our partners. It will include the community as well coming together, and they will actually drive and lead the direction of, of what the community land trust, where we should be, what we should be doing, and how we should be executing as well. And then again, we'll um, establish a job description for a project manager, um, being able to provide assistance there, and then working with some partners to do some of the things that we were just talking about, conduct that market and feasibility analysis, build those strategic partnerships, develop marketing materials. This is gonna be an educational process. I can't underestimate the value of education, not only to you, but to us, and also to the residents in the community, helping them understand what a community land trust is, providing them with examples, making sure that, um, that we're doing this adequately, we're doing it the right way, we're addressing all of the right questions and being able to move this forward as well, which speaks to the community engagement and outreach as well. So just wanted to add some perspective around the timeline and the efforts that we've been able to take to this date. So thank you for that, uh, this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you, Chair Mendez. Now I have several questions because I've sure. sat through several of the presentation. Go for it. All right, thank you. I just want Okay, so the first question is like a very simple one. I just wanted to see, is the CLT, I'm not clear at this point, are you a standalone organization or will you be with the city? I wasn't clear I'm about sorry. that part. So the housing, the housing fund is a standalone private 501c3. We're designated as a community development financial institution. Oh, I'm sorry. We're designated as a, um, as a, um, um, CDFI by the Department of Treasury. So no, we are a separate organization than the Barnes Fund. Okay, good deal. 
And then can anyone qualify for the CLT? And what I mean by that is because we have such a crisis in Nashville as it relates to housing, we talk about some, like someone pointed out to me yesterday, said, you know, I make $80,000 and I still don't have 20% to put down on the houses. Of course, you know, if they want to go live out in Juliet, Ju I mean, Ju um, listen, I said Juliet, Mount Juliet. I got really property on Mount Juliet. But yeah, <laughs> but if they went to um, Mount Juliet, just kind of like the, the persons that have these vouchers now, you know, the vouchers are not good in the city. So to kind of just bring it back, is anyone able to, like, keeping that person in mind, would they be able to qualify uh, for this type of uh, shared equity housing? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And that's the, whole, that's the whole point of this, is creating an opportunity that reduces the value by taking the land out of the equation. So now it makes it more obtainable for an individual of that, of that price range to be able to afford a housing structure within that community. Okay, good deal. Those. So we're not just looking at a specific type of AMI as it relates to, like, there's, is there a cutoff? That's the piece I'm not. There, there will end up being a cutoff, and it also depends upon the funding source. So, I mean, I think that that's a question actually for the Barnes Fund and for the Housing Fund to reflect upon where is the need here and where are the gaps? And, I mean, what, what can be done about them? But for instance, if in the future, federal funding sources were used, and there's a cap of 80% AMI, then that would have to be respected. Okay. And then, um, will you also have, uh, in purchasing land, will you have, I guess, the latitude to also kind of mix up the zoning to make it more affordable? So in other words, if we know normally there's only a certain amount of um, houses that are to a lot, a lot of times people say that zoning can greatly affect affordability. We all have the latitude to say, well, we know it's only supposed to be maybe 10 to this lot, but we're gonna put 12, you know, we're gonna do something a little bit different. Is that something that y'all, that you can do? We're not planning to go beyond what zoning requires. Um, I mean, we don't know what land we're gonna donate to this and what property will be acquired. And so um, if the density in the surrounding neighborhood uh, is at a rate in which it makes sense for us to ask for increased density, then I certainly think that we will make that ask, but um, we're still gonna stay within whatever those parameters are. We won't go beyond that. Okay, it's just something to think about, because a lot of people share that the I actual mean, zoning, you know, laws, they impact affordability, because if you can only put so much on there, but. Yeah. I'm just saying we won't go against zoning, okay. clearly. Right? I'm not trying to make you nervous. I'm just saying yeah. these are some things to kind of sure. think about, too. Definitely. And also, when you acquire uh, the, uh, the, the housing as it relates to the taxes, do you follow the normal process of it has to be a year, and if it's not a year, it, or if the family claims it? So you said that you're going to get some tax property, right, from the city, or did I misunderstand that? Um, property that's behind on taxes that you may take that. I'm trying to see what the rules are for that. So it's normally a year. Do you have the same... So the properties that we donate through the Barnes Fund already have gone beyond that year-long process. Okay, that's so what I want to know. we don't have that issue when we donate to the housing fund or to any other nonprofit. Yeah. Okay, okay. And then this is my last question, Chairman. Thank you so much. So um, how, do you, how will we deal with um, housing across the city so it's not just in the same areas over and over again. And once again, it speaks to that zoning because some of the wealthier areas have down zoned the property. I think we just have to be honest. And so some of this, even if you want to do it, it would never, just because of the zoning, and that's the kind of the point I was making. You're going to have to look at that zoning because it's, if not, it's just going to be in certain areas. And thank you so much for your time. That's my last question. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And that's actually why in Marshall's uh, presentation, he mentioned a blend of property that we're donating and then a, pro um, a blend of what they're acquiring because Metro only owns what we own. And we tend to not own property in Green Hills and Bell Mead. Not to say that the CLT will be in these areas, but I'm just saying that with There's acquiring property, right, we have the flexibility and the ability to um, entertain and explore those geographies because we definitely want to be intentional about dispersing and not um, concentrating all the, the development, not just being to see the CLT, but just for Barnes and Metro in general, we want to be diverse with where we invest affordable housing in. And the housing fund believes that same concept, just like Laurel House, what Laurel House did for the Gulch. We're looking at those distressed areas and trying to see 
where's the best place for us to acquire property as well. Um, we're not a developer, we don't plan to be a developer, but we plan to look at areas that we can have developed by working with our nonprofit developers and for-profit developers where they can come and also provide some assistance to us as well. Mr. Hastings, your light was on for a while. Yes, hello, all of you. Uh, the question that I have is, I, I think you already answered it, that uh, the locations that we're looking at, and I know we've talked already, uh, we have not decided on those things, and uh, the process that are, that, are, that are out there right now are, are not all, it's not down packed, it's not written down. I know that there's a place for us to do this, and we have to do it, we gotta do it smart. Uh, find the correct place for these properties. Uh, I don't know, and maybe that's some type of legislation or whatever that we can do, is all of the, the property, does all of the properties that we're looking at uh, doing some things with, does all of that have to be tax properties? Do you know about that? Or it may be something that we need to, we need to look at, back tax properties. Um, no, it, it definitely does not have to be um, exclusively back tax properties that are donated to the housing fund. Um, Metro are, you know, we, we own parcels that are larger than what we have in our portfolio for back tax. Um, typically those properties are about a half acre, but we own some larger, some, you know, we, are, we own more land. Um, it's not something that we've uh, exhausted because we do wanna leave that space um, to Marshall's point for that advisory committee to have some thought partnership around what geographies make the most sense, what properties make the most sense that's within Metro's portfolio. And so we're not leaving that off of the table by any means. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> One of the things that I do know that, that there are other pieces of property that are out in the um, uh, White Bridge Road area, all of that, uh, there's other places besides just the inner scope of the city, especially when looking at the mass transit system that we're that we're we're trying to get into. Uh, those are things to keep in mind. So I just wanted to let you guys know to keep some things in mind, and uh, we'll we'll go even further to see where we are right now and how far we can go with this. All right, thank you. And um, I know it's awkward to get questions from behind you, but uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask a few. Um, uh, Morgan, on the, the funding, uh, sort of a two-part question, uh, the, what's the amount that we're going to get asked for at the next meeting? And then um, the second question, which is sort of relates to it, is uh, when, when do we foresee the land trust being up and going? Um, so the first question I can answer, but the second I'll defer to Marshall. Um, so the first one is that uh, on March 20th, it'll be $250,000 that we will be bringing to council for funding. It's not the entire um, budget for operational. It's um, a significant part of it, um, and is, it'll be over the course of two years um, that that money will be allocated. But for us, we wanted to ensure that we were funding that staff person in particular, um, the technical assistance from um, Emily's group at Grounded Solutions, um, and legal as well. So we wanted to make sure that those portions were definitely covered by the Barnes Fund. And then there were uh, some other parts, um, to Marshall's point, talking about the marketing, community engagement, um, that he wanted to um, seek additional funding for. Um, so we're exploring that right now, but what'll be at council will be those three pieces coming in at 250. So that, that's, uh 250 to cover two years worth of activity? Yes. And is, do you foresee that that is, uh, that 150 is 150 a year forever, or does that tail off at some point? It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah, so that speaks to 150. That speaks to what it would mean for us to operate at scale. And so um, the Barnes Fund is providing 250, which would essentially be 125,000 um, per year. And so that other 25,000, which would speak to some of the community engagement that I think is critical and also some of the marketing um, that also needs to be developed. So we're also seeking additional resources and partnerships out there to bring some resources to the table. Right, so like the legal mm -hmm. cost is not gonna be at that same rate every right. single year once you're sustained. Absolutely. You know, develop those documents on the front end. All right, and, and what about the part about uh, when will the land trust be up and going? So once we get the blessing from you as well, we're gonna start looking at 
um, establishing an advisory committee and then ha letting them provide some some opportunity to weigh in on the job description and bringing in the project manager. Right now, we don't have any properties donated to us. We're looking um, at opportunities that are being presented to us now. We have other individuals and other groups that are calling us about um, donating to the community land trust, so they're asking the same question. When will it be up and running? When will we do this? Uh, the advisory committee will happen as quickly as um, my board comes back together in April. So once we know that we have all the blessings, they have already um, provided me with support and many of them saying, hey, I'm willing to participate. So I think by April, we should be able to execute and move forward with developing that advisory committee. And that's when it will come forward. I'll also add to that, I mean, this is going to be on a similar timeline to all the other uh, nonprofits and developments that we allocate funding to. I mean, we can't build sticks and bricks overnight. And so once we allocate those funds for um, the actual development, aside from the operations, we typically give nonprofits around two years to complete um, whatever that first phase of investment is. Um, and so we foresee that being a two year window. Um, sometimes, you know, Titles need to be cleared, environmental things end up happening, things that you can't foresee, and so it may be go beyond those two years, but we typically like for it to be within that two years and then not exceeding four years for that construction and development. So I guess I'm feeling the cross-examining lawyer come out in me. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to get like a year or a range of years of like when will the trust exist and be doing business? Right, I mean, it's... It's within within two years. Right. It's difficult to get a, give a definitive answer because unlike other CLT models, this is within the housing fund. And so the housing fund's already created. The Barnes Fund has already said we're giving X amount of dollars to them. And so it's already starting in some ways, right? Like they don't have to create an additional 501c3 or anything like that. So we don't have like a specific answer because it's already it's already started in a lot of ways. Yeah. So it has. My board has approved it. Um, what we're looking for is just to um, create the advisory committee. Um, there's two distinct roles. There is a CLT that has its own 501c3, and then there's a CLT that operates as a program under a 501c3. Mm -hmm. So this will operate simply as a program under us um, for the community land trust. So establishing an advisory committee instead of a board of directors we pretty much can execute that as quickly as possible. All right, all right let me try it this way. Um, <laughs> when do y'all anticipate being able to accept a piece of property into the CLT? Well, I mean, I'll say that, right, but I'll, I mean, I'll say that if it's through Barnes's typical process, in the fall is when we'll be talking with Marshall to look at that proposal for what that first phase will look like. And so once it's brought to council after that, fall round around August, then it'll be right along the same timeline as all of our other grants. So hopefully early next year is when we'll be able, they'll be able to acquire property. So, so I would add, we're still trying, well, I think there are legal documents that go along with this, like the ground at lease, and I think we pretty much have those and can move fast on that. So if somebody wanted to donate us some property tomorrow, I think we're in a position to say, hey, you know what, we can accept that donated property to us. And what we'll do is work with our legal team and being able to structure what that deed of trust looks like. Great. I'm just speaking to Barnes. Yeah. We can't fast track That's the process right. because it has to go. You, you need the microphone. Sorry, I was just speaking to the Barnes's process right. because we can't bring it, we have to bring it before council and so we can't fast track that in any way. It has to first come to our commission, then they recommend it to you all. And so that process simply can't happen before August. All right, a couple other questions. Um, the the tax abatement um, idea, does, does that require a change in state law or can we do it locally? State law, probably. Okay, um, who's, uh, are, when, when can you guys be sure about that? Um. Um, I mean, it's something that we're starting to look at right now. I'm trying to see who at the state level can be a sponsor on this. So we, I mean, we're 
we're just figuring out the, re the weeds right now, rather, with our legal folks to figure that out. Um, and so as we continue to build that out, I think that's when we'll go to Emily's group and to the legal folks that Marshall ends up um, partnering with to make sure that whatever we have is inclusive of the CLT model as well. Yeah. It might sound like we're like looking over something. I think there's two conflicting issues here. Yeah. One is what the barns or what you can do for us, right. and then the other is what the housing fund can do on its own without and working with others. And so right now, and I think if it was a matter of if somebody, an individual came out there and said, hey, we want to donate some property, it's just a matter of us working with our legal team and executing that, mm -hmm. you know, next week. But the process that the Barnes Funds has to go through is a separate issue, so. Um, I'm, I'm down to just a few, and then there's a couple buttons pressed. Um, so the, the, the legal stuff that y'all are talking about, um, I'm assuming, um, Mr. Crawford, that's gonna be lawyers hired by you, not Metro Legal doing the work? That is correct. All right, good. Um, no offense, but this is, this is very technical, and they don't have the expertise for this. Um, um, then, uh, Ms. Thaden, uh, for the resale prices of homes, I, I mean, I, I'm assuming there's multiple different models. Um, uh, what, what, what do you uh, foresee being the way that the purchase, the resale price is determined? Um, so what we do when we're developing new community land trusts and brought on as consultants is, is that we do a, a pretty complex affordability analysis, which takes into account that um, how you do your pricing on a CLT home is not necessarily the same in every place in the city. You have to take into account hot markets, cold markets, and then your the resale formula you use needs to take into account things like, are, is there rapid appreciation in some parts of your market but not others? And so you can buffer that depending upon how you pick your resale formula for the goals and for the context that you are in. Um, and so that's a part of the contract that we are hoping to do with the housing fund where we'll We'll do all of that analysis on affordable pricing. We'll come up with a pricing methodology and then um, do a lot of number crunching to find the right resale formula that then that then will be presented as options. Presented as options to when somebody buys? No, no, to the housing fund to select. Okay, I see. Um, all right. But I mean, the goal here is to balance wealth building with affordability and make sure you get that right and you have a long-term perspective, not a short. And I guess, and so we're, uh, and that will end up being the housing funds decision and not, not a metro decision or a Barnes fund decision? Correct. All right. Last one um, for um, Morgan. I think you answered this already. Um, the, anything that goes to the land trust will have its, the title reviewed and cleaned up if it's got problems from the tax um, uh, refund process? back tax process? Um, again, it's the same process that we do for our any other properties that we donate to nonprofits. And so um, they uh, unfortunately often do have to go through a process of clearing things. Um, that's whether it's environmental, we dig and find things underground or um, sometimes or whether um, it's through, you know, the actual title process. So the nonprofit will be the one to um, build that into their contingency and, and go through that process. So, Mr. Crawford, I'm sure you're accustomed to these kind of issues, but uh, I know there have been, um, because we're dealing with back tax properties in Metro and all the complexities of that law, um, I know at least, you know, Ms. Bauer's organization back there has ended up having months and months of carrying costs um, while title has been cleaned up on at least one property. So, you know, be careful about that. And my suggestion would be if there's anything that uh, the housing fund um, sees about the process in which Metro cleans up title, um, you know, I think suggestions are probably welcome because, again, it's not a specialty um, for uh, Metro Legal. Um, now a couple of buttons got pressed, so uh, uh, Council Lady Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I had, I have three more questions. One I think you actually asked, Mr. Chair, but I didn't see it. So it was actually in that pie chart that you had put up there. There were two spaces on the side, one for marketing, one for staff that were both blue. But I only saw the eighty thousand. Is the eighty thousand both marketing and staff? I don't. Or is marketing not up there at all? 
so marketing, in terms of um, the mar actual? Yeah, marketing's not up there in, t in terms of costs. I mean, we've built some in, and we know that um, it's critical, but that blue is for a staff person, a okay. qualified individual, but we are building in, that's the additional resources we will raise to generate for, for marketing. And okay, so that's something you're taking on on yourself, so it didn't even need to be in there. Is yeah, that what you're so saying? So that speaks to 150,000, so all of those. So yeah, we're taking that into account, the 125,000 that each year that the Barnes has given to us is just 125, so there's 25 extra thousand dollars that we're gonna take on to try to raise additional resources for. Okay, that will be dedicated to marketing. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. And marketing, then... Let me just add marketing and community engagement. Okay, marketing and community engagement, gotcha. Right. And then the advisory committee, how many people sit on the advisory committee? So we haven't identified what that number will look like just yet. I okay. think um, we'll get with our board members, we'll bring in our partners, we'll sit down and see what is an appropriate number for okay. that. Mm -hmm. And then how, if members are interested, do they uh, just kind of offer up, not that you have to choose them, but I'm sure there's a lot of people that want to be a part of this. How would they, or do you just normally do it a different way? But I'm sure people might want to say, hey, I want to be a part of this. It's not a Metro thing, so I'm just wondering how do we direct them to you if they're interested? Absolutely. Um, just have, have them call me. Have them call me. Just put their name in the hat. I got like... I had about 20 business cards of people saying, hey, I would love to be a part of this. So um, they can reach out to the housing fund, speak to me directly, and then what we'll do is bring those names before my board members, one of my board members will step up and be the chair of the advisory, and then we'll identify, we'll talk, who else, and then we'll put it out there for a public opportunity for people to come together. Okay, yeah, that sounds really exciting. And then I had um, one last question, and then I'm gonna stop, because there's only a couple of us here now. You, you have some questions? No, got a question? Okay, so this is my last question. Um, so in terms of the um, taxing, I thought that was good. I support this, I think it's awesome. I know 15, 20 years ago, some council members tried to do it, it just didn't work. I think my mom was actually one of them. It just has to be, yeah, yeah, it's just, the, you know, people just gotta be, you know, it's, it's just whatever, yeah. But, but the last question is, um, I think the part you were saying about the taxes are correct. And, what I'm talking about is just how should they pay, what share of taxes should they pay if they're not assuming the full value of the home? And so I would like to hear more about that in the future. You don't have to address it now, just letting you know that it's something I'm interested in. And it seems like one way that you could um, measure it too, because normally these people would not have homes, they would just be in apartments, right? So I think one way would be to assume the value that they pay in taxes versus if they did not pay any at all seems like would be um, one of them. And so I'm through. Just know you have my support. So when y'all want to bring it to the council, you got my support. Thank you. Councilor Allen. Thank you. I'd like to move that we give uh, the housing fund whatever blessing they need to, to move forward if, if we need to do that in the form of an official motion. Um, I, I don't think, uh, well, we don't have it on an agenda, so I don't think we could do that. Okay. Um, and at the next meeting, we're going to have a chance to vote on the funding um, that she, that Ms. Mansa described. So I think um, we'll we'll be up uh, back um, two weeks from today with an opportunity to have that vote. Officially vote. Good. Well, I appreciate the presentation. I've been I've been dying to see this happen for several years now. So I'm thrilled that we're finally moving things. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your support. All right. Th that is uh, everybody, and uh, we, we chased off uh, everybody. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming today. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. We're adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.